Well, here we are in Luke, uh, again, Luke 17. And again, Luke throws one of those famous curveballs. I'm like, oh, this is kind of interesting. His commentators say that in Luke 17, um, there are actually four of these stories. Uh, two are in the first passages, and then we have two today. The faith of the mustard seed and the story of the slave working in the vineyard, working out in the field, coming in. I don't know about you. I kind of feel a little bit weird by that story. It's kind of like, what? This is not the Jesus I know. That's, that's not what I think is trying to be taught, that, you know, you constantly. And then, then I kind of like, mm, well, let's see what a little bit more of that passage looks like. You know, there's partly for us it's hard for our minds because it's kind of this idea of, of employee and employer. We have that kind of connotation in life. That's what we most know. Like, oh, well, you're paid to do a job, and then when you finish your job, you're done, or you get your own time. You know, workers' rights and those kind of things that came about in the last century uh, made a difference for people. Seven-day work weeks are pretty much should be gone. They're still around in places. We have to continue to work on that. Um, but the labor movement, you know, really that transpired and started in the Methodist church, kept kids from working in factories. Uh, you know, some social issues, that we, there should be time off. Those are things that took deep root in United Methodism or Methodist Church. It changed the way we see the world and understand the world. We value one another and other people. We've lost a little bit of that over time. Corporate America, we kind of give into it. And yes, the more you work, the more you get paid. The, but if we pay you low enough, you'll keep having to work more. Three, four jobs. You know, that's just, that's not, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about, the life abundant. But, but what does it mean for us? Can you, you, you you've been there. The best example I can think of is that, that you get everything in the house. I'm outside of my, my zone. Uh, <laughs> You get everything in the house ready for Thanksgiving. Do you know how much effort goes into getting that big, huge Thanksgiving meal ready for everybody and their cousin to come? And then there's the one that shows up. And the house is too cold, it's too hot. The turkey is overcooked or undercooked. You know, there's always somebody that it didn't matter what you did, it wasn't good enough. Come on. You're serious? Like, what did you bring to this party? Yourself? And you, all you come up with is a complaint? Maybe. I don't know that. Maybe the kind of... I don't know what the, what the slave felt in this story. Like, they'd been out tending sheep, working in the field, and then they come in, and lo and behold, this slob had sat over there and done nothing all day long and wanted something else. And the slave went and did it. Never enough. Always expecting something more. Yeah. But I don't think that's what Jesus intends for us. I don't think that's what's being said in this passage. I think it's thinking about it. But I also think about it that, that part of what we do in response to the grace that has been given to us, the forgiveness in our lives, that we continue to toil and to work to bring about God's kingdom in the world for other people and for ourselves. And that work is never done. I think that's what's being said here. You know, it's kind of like, sometimes we see this portrayed in Hollywood where some person will save the life of another, a soldier or an uh, explorer. They'll save the life, and in devotion to that person who saved their life, the person who lives on continues to vow to serve them and to be with them the rest of their life. It's, that's kind of the Hollywood version, I guess, of it. But maybe the role that we play in that is for us. And there is a special amount of gratitude and thanksgiving for the goodness that God has given to us. For that grace 
and love and mercy that's been bestowed upon our life, that we understand that there's absolutely nothing that we can do that can return God's faithfulness and God's gift to us. Nothing. The only way that we get it and receive it is through God's good gift to us. But in an effort to give God thanks and glory, we offer our lives and all that we are back to God forever and ever and ever. One commentator put it this way. No disciple says, Now I have completed all the duties of love, and it's my turn to be served. Yep. Done all I can. I'm done. Y'all can wait on me now. It's not the way it works in Christianity. It's not the way it works. I mean, you know... There's a part of us that our Christian life is, you know, you run in sliding into the grave, as they say. Go as hard and as fast in following Christ and loving Christ and loving our neighbors as ourselves all of our life. I remember one friend of mine, she was uh, Murphy Nelson. I'll I'll mention her by name because I think this is a wonderful thing and I know some Bob knows her and some others may remember. She died at 103 She used to say, I pray for enough grace to go through whatever it is that I need. And she said, I used to, one of the preacher types, he used to give her 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 grief. He said, you can't pray for grace. It's already given. It's free to give. And she said, I'm just praying for just enough to, to get through, to live, to do what I need to do in my life. Just enough grace to get through. And you know what? God's already given us that. We've already got it. But it doesn't hurt to keep looking for it, to be on the horizon for it, to see where God is growing in our lives. It doesn't matter if we're three or 103 or somewhere in between. No disciple says, now I've completed all the duties of love. It's my turn to be served. thought about this passage this little idea of the mustard seed i remember it i almost got mom to bring it uh in vacation bible school or sunday school once we made these little pins mine's on a they were these you you decorate the art and put it inside the plastic that'll never go away and so it was faith of the mustard seed and we had a mustard seed you know, the, 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 the gardener in me wonders, it's like, wait a minute, now the, gar- the mustard seed that we plant in the ground, you know, to get some mustard greens, it doesn't look quite like a tree. I don't, I don't think it's quite the same thing, but that's okay. But I remember, you know, I took this little piece of orange round paper, and it's got a mustard seed and a dot of Elmer's glue that's way too much glue, you know, that thing is encased. Faith of the mustard seed or something's written on it. That's it. That's it. That's what faith of a mustard seed. I don't know where you are. I mean, perhaps you've got more faith in a mustard seed, and that's great. You may feel like you don't have any. Sometimes that's where we feel in life. That's the human side of us. And yet this dependence and this reliance upon God helps us be able to To move trees is what this text says. This is the Lucan passage, and it says to move a mulberry tree. Isn't that interesting? They said, some commentators said, perhaps it's Jesus is making a reference back to when Jesus curses the fig tree that's found in Luke, and that the mulberry tree and the fig tree in the ancient Greek is the same basic root. That's your 50 cent learn today that you can bring up at a cocktail party that you get to go to next time. It's the same root, so maybe that's what the author's doing there. Perhaps it's a different illustration that Jesus used, but he used the faith of the mustard seed, and perhaps they knew about the mulberry tree, or they were standing near one and said, like that mulberry tree, you can move. When you're going up 52, though, you might want to lean on some of the other ones. You know, you're headed up that way and see the very tip of Pilot Mountain, and you say, if you had the faith of the mustard seed, you can move Pilot Mountain. That's the way it is in Mark and Matthew. 
But I don't know about you. I don't, I don't exactly know what's going on in that. But I think what the illustration is trying to tell us is that in the midst of faith, faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in the world, faith in love, that we can move challenges of trees and mountains that are in our lives and in our world. I think that's what it's saying. I think it's important for us to hear that again. Because sometimes you look out the windshield of life and you realize I'm not sure what's going to happen next and yet that you know that, that Christ is with you in our midst through the Spirit's power doesn't mean it's all going to be great but it does say that our faith helps to move him enables moving trees and mountains in our world Today's World Communion Sunday. I don't know if you knew that. It's probably a highlight on your phone. I don't know if you can get, get, get it to show up on your, your eye calendar. You know, I, but it's an important day in the church. Every October. I remember growing up as a kid. I thought, how cool is this? World Communion Sunday. All of a sudden, everybody at like 1135 is going to take a piece of bread and a little bit of juice at the same time in the whole world that are Christian and remind us of our solidarity and unity. How do they make that happen? Well, that's a little technical. World Communion Sunday was originally started in 1933 by the Presbyterians. Part of the idea and the effort was to be reminded that, that churches, uh, even if they're not the same denomination or even if they're not in the same part of the world, that we can at one time come together and receive communion together as God's family, brothers and sisters in Christ around the table. Now, it's not all at 1135 or whenever it is that it happens. Not everybody's sitting here watching the calendar. But it is the idea and the understanding and a remembrance of the power of God to be able to work in the world to bring about Christian unity. In unity of faith oh it's still aspiration <laughs> we've only been doing it now about 90 years and it still needs to inspire us to come together I love our call to worship prayer it talked about uh, pray for our church uh, united and, and or, or divided and troubled troubled and divided bring it together that's part of what it means come together for a clearer understanding of what God is doing and can do for us in our world. Come together to this day, I'm sure, with heavy hearts, uh, most closely uh, related to us, and to see uh, those who suffer, especially in Florida, from Ian coming through, and other places of distress and destruction. And yet we've already heard appeals and calls from from our church, from, from other leaders of ways to bring a relief and to assistance, to not be so far away from our friends and neighbors. We saw last night on the news about the, the stampede in Indonesia. 124, I think, were killed at a soccer game. We hear continued uh, violence and, and protest uh, in Iran to advocate for rights for women, to choose their own what to wear. Can you all imagine if I told you what you had to wear? That wouldn't set real good with me and you either. And of course, Ukraine is... Vladimir Putin has taken more land than any other time in European history since World War II. And the Ukrainians... Just to send him another note, said, well, we just took back one of the properties that you took the other day. I love it. Go Ukraine. I'm so ready to have a victory there. I think part of that is what it reminds us to be people of faith, to be mindful of the world, to know what's going on, and to allow our faith to guide us and to give us hope in a time that seems hopeless in some ways to let this faith the size of a mustard seed 
begin to continue to grow in our lives. To not give up, to be sustained, to keep going despite challenges around us. It's a tough task. Not something that's e- e- easy to do, not something to be taken lightly. But it's to, we're to be empowered and to be strengthened through Christ's Spirit and through the, the bread and the juice at this table we gather around today to be able to go forth into the world to bring about God's kingdom. All glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.